Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 263, recorded on October 19th, 2022. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. We start this week with Google solving the big problem of not having enough operating systems. Called Kata OS and aimed at what Google calls secure embedded systems running ambient machine learning workloads. I think I uh, dig their jive here, though. It's, it's a new OS for a new type of workload with a different focus. We'll get into this. They want something that is hyper-focused on the embedded hardware that is doing what they call this ambient machine learning, kind of always monitoring the environment, taking in data constantly, sensors galore. And on top of that, they want to build it with some modern technologies that are a little more verifiable and a little more hip. In their announcement, they write, Kata OS provides a verifiably secure platform that protects users' privacy because it's logically impossible for applications to breach the kernel's hardware security protections, and the system components are verifiably secure. Kata OS is also implemented almost entirely in Rust, which provides a strong starting point for software security since it eliminates an entire class of bugs, such as off-by-one errors and buffer overflows. I guess that means Fuchsia is old and busted now. Or maybe just destined for smart speakers. Kata OS, on the other hand, well, it's part of Google's Project Sparrow, which is something of a demonstration project which combines Kata OS with a secured hardware platform built on top of RISC-V. The GitHub repo for Kata OS, well, it's been extant for a couple of months now, but as we record... Just two days ago, it was updated with a full readme and a lot more details. We'll have a link for the curious in the show notes. The current GitHub release, well, it includes most of the Kata OS core pieces to hear it from Google, including the frameworks they use for Rust, an alternate root server written in Rust, and more. Google also says their goal is to open source all of Project Sparrow when the time is right. But in the meantime, they're focusing a lot on Kata OS and how it's built and how what they say it's critical for this new generation of embedded devices that are going to collect this data constantly. They must be what Google says, quote, mathematically proven to keep data secure. In this case, Google's trying to meet those lofty goals by building on top of SEL4, which is an advanced microkernel that's been notable for having comprehensive formal verification, way beyond what any popular commercial operating system is really using these days, and doing so without compromising performance, at least to hear the project talk about it. Then on top of your small verifiable microkernel, you use a framework called CamKiz to build all of your system components. That's because CamKiz, well, it's a software development and runtime framework designed to build secure, microkernel-based operating systems. They might be on to something here. And some of that is really what draws, I think, a bright distinction line be- between, say, Fuchsia and Kata OS, or what exists out there today. Because they're really bringing all of this together. All the exciting technology aside, the real question here, with any Google platform or operating system, how much adoption will this see outside of Google? And how much support will it get once it's no longer a fun new research project? Well, of course, only time can tell on that one. But uh, why not send us a boost with your best guess? Security researchers in Germany alerted the SUSE development team to buffer overwrite issues they found in the Linux kernel that they could trigger just with Wi-Fi packets. The SUSE team quickly then informed the Linux kernel security team who jumped into action. During the team's research, aided by Intel, they found multiple problems in the WLAN stack, also exploitable over the air. Now, we don't have all the details just yet, but looking at the commit series, it seems the code that got fixed all came from the first quarter of 2019, with the bulk of the issues being introduced in the 5.1 or 5.2 kernel. So, unfortunately, I think that means these flaws have likely shipped and plenty of distributions by now. Yeah, we've got five separate CVEs related to this by my count. The good news is Linus has already merged the patches into Linux 6.1. 
which just hit RC this weekend. We'll have more details on that in a few minutes. But also, you're going to have to wait for distro makers who will need to backport those fixes to their kernels that aren't based on 6.1, at least not yet. And well, I just have a terrible feeling for all those Android users out there who are maybe lucky enough to get Android based on Linux 5. I just doubt they're going to see any updates for this. And they're walking around scanning for Wi-Fi all the time. Really, all Linux users will need to be vigilant when using Wi-Fi these days. A buffer overwrite triggered remotely by a malicious Wi-Fi packet? Yeah, that's no fun. The most serious flaw here? It seems to be triggered when just scanning for open APs. Now, as for public exploits that people have seen actually in the wild, none have been spotted so far. But it won't take long. There are several proofs of concepts that are posted online on GitHub and various places shared in security threads. They're getting linked around already. Uh, I was able to find a fully working tool rather quickly this morning when doing a little research for this story. So that's what's been happening with my laptop. Darn it, Chris. (laughs) Now, on the plus side, we do expect patches to get backported pretty quickly. So good time to keep an eye on your updates. Mozilla has given us a reason to cover Firefox this week. A brand new version, 106, is getting a lot of attention by most people for its much improved PDF viewer, and it does have support now for text writing, drawing, and signatures. And I'll be honest, that sounds pretty nice. But what we think is fantastic are the improvements to the Fox's WebRTC capabilities. Firefox is now using LibWebRTC 103 with better screen sharing support for Wayland users and lower CPU usage. Also on Wayland, Firefox 106 now has gesture support for swiping right or left to go back and forwards in the browser. You know, if we're honest, Firefox's lagging WebRTC has been a bit of a challenge for us here at Jupyter Broadcasting, and I've got to imagine for all of you out there also living the virtual meeting lifestyle. Yeah, seeing them get up to date on that LibWebRTC library, I think is great. That was an area where I felt like Firefox was lagging behind the Chromium-based browsers and otherwise has been crushing it recently. Also in web browser news this week, the impervious browser's public alpha was released, and as of now, it's only available for Mac and Linux platforms. This new browser bills itself as a suite of peer-to-peer tools for various things like communication, data transport, payments, that sort of stuff. It's all built directly into the web browser along with a secure messenger, support for group video calls, live collab doc editing, decentralized identities, and even Bitcoin Lightning support. I'm not sure really where this one's going, but they're offering an awful lot. And you can find out more at impervious.ai, and we'll have a link to the project's GitHub in the notes. If all goes as planned, Fedora 37 is scheduled to release mid-next week. And the project is throwing a virtual release party. Good news, you're invited. The project says that the virtual release party is a great way to learn more about the latest Fedora Linux release. But more importantly, it's your chance to spend time with a wonderful Fedora community. They hope to include informational sessions that will feature updates about things like Fedora Core OS, the new installer interface preview, and let you meet some new project members. The event takes place on November 4th and 5th. Registration is free, and of course, we'll have a link in the notes. Linode.com slash LAN. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account. And it's a great way to support the show. Linode is fast, reliable cloud hosting. And they've been a longtime sponsor of Linux Action News because our audience loves Linode. They become passionate customers once they sign up. It's why we run everything over there because we love it too. Everything we've built in the last couple of years that runs in the cloud, it runs on Linode. I think the best part is how they've built their business up. Over 19 years nearly, they've had to just build a really good competitive business. That means things like their support department have real humans all day, every day. That means their system performs, right? All their systems, their network connections, the hard drives, the CPUs, even their GPU rigs, which I just recently had the fortune to actually try one out. And they're 30 to 50% cheaper than the hyperscalers out there that want to lock you into their crazy esoteric platforms with their crazy names for everything. And I think they outperform 
all of those hyperscalers. And independent studies have shown that as well. And with that $100, you can go find out for yourself. Today, Linode has 11 data centers and a dozen more coming next year with great features such as object storage and cloud firewalls and backups and Kubernetes and Terraform support and so much more, as well as one-click deployments for things like NextCloud, game servers, blog servers, web servers, control panels. Their marketplace is packed full of good stuff. So go try something. Go learn something. Go build something and try it out while you support the show. Linode.com slash L-A-N. That's Linode.com slash LAN. And a thank you to Collide. Collide.com slash LAN. Collide is endpoint security that uses the most important, powerful, untapped resource in IT, the end users. When you're trying to achieve security goals for yourself, for a new boss, for an auditor, been there. The conventional wisdom has been to lock every single device down. Old school style, like MDMs that force disruptive agents onto employees' devices that make them run slow or sometimes incompatible with apps and often introduce security issues of their own. You know it's true. (laughs) <laughs> it's like the old way of doing IT, and it puts IT and end users kind of at odds. Collide does things differently. Instead of forcing changes on users, Collide sends them security recommendations via Slack. Collide will automatically notify your team when their devices are insecure, and then give them step-by-step instructions on how to solve that problem. And by reaching out to employees via a friendly Slack DM and educating them about company policies, Collide helps you build a culture in which everyone contributes to security because everyone understands how and why to do it. And for IT admins, Collide gives you a dashboard for days. You can monitor the security of your entire fleet. It can be on Macs, Windows, and of course, beautiful Linux. You can see at a glance which employees have their disks encrypted, if they have their OS updates installed, a password manager, etc. Just making it easy to run reports and prove compliance to your auditors, customers, leadership, and to yourself. So that's Collide user-centered cross-platform endpoint security for teams that slack. You can meet your compliance goals by putting users first. Just visit collide.com slash land to find out how. You go there, you sign up for a free trial, they're going to hook you up with a goodie bag that includes a t-shirt. I don't know if that t-shirt has a picture of my face on it. I wouldn't expect that. I don't know why you thought it would. But you get one when you go to collide.com slash land and you activate a free trial. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash L-A-N. We wrap up today by looking ahead a bit at the Linux 6.1 release and the path to get there. It seems Linus has been getting just a bit frustrated with all the last-minute commits coming in this time around, writing, quote, Let me just say, and after I got my machine sorted out, caught up with the merge window, I was somewhat frustrated with various late pull requests. I've mentioned this before, but it's really quite annoying to get quite a few pull requests in the last few days of the merge window. He then continued with a bit more insight into why he can find it just so annoying. He says, quote, Yes, the merge window is two weeks, but that's very much to allow me time to look things over. Not two weeks to hurriedly put together a branch that you send to Linus on Friday of the second week. The whole do an all-nighter to get the paper in the day before the deadline is something that should have gone out the window after high school, not for kernel development. Well, we do want our kernel developers to be healthy, happy, and well-rested. Linus also seems to be trying to manage expectations a little around Rust. While true, 6.1 will feature initial Rust support, he describes that support as, quote, the initial Rust scaffolding, no actual real Rust code in the kernel yet, the infrastructure is there. Yeah, and that seems fair and probably a good idea. We saw things get really crazy with the 6.0 cycle when it sounded like maybe the initial Rust support would get in there, and then they pulled way back when we discovered it wouldn't land in there. And I think we need to set the expectations here. This is just the beginning of Rust support, but we really will probably get pretty excited when something is actually written in Rust shipping inside the kernel. That's probably the moment to really celebrate. You know, once we can use a driver, say, that's written in Rust on some real hardware we have in front of us, perhaps? Yeah, exactly. So the stuff in 6.1 that we're going to dig into will probably be the things that we suspect will impact day-to-day Linux users the most. 
There's a lot of work going into improve AMD platforms on Linux, specifically the Zen 4 processors. And of course, one of the big ones for us is the improvements to ButterFS. Kernel 6.1 introduces async buffer writes with more than twice the throughput for file operations. We've also seen some chatter that 6.1 might just end up as the next LTS release of the kernel which could be just in time for a future Debian stable release, among others. After being prompted on the kernel mailing list, Linux stable maintainer Greg Groh Hartman commented, I usually pick the, quote, last kernel of the year, and based on the regular release cycle, yes, 6.1 will be that kernel. But I can't promise anything until it's released, for obvious reasons. Fair enough. Linux 5.15 LTS is last year's long-term kernel version. That is currently set to be maintained through October 2023. Now, that can be extended if there's enough interest and people that are willing to help Greg maintain that. And if Linux 6.1 did become the next LTS, that would be supported at least through December 2025. So, if everything stays on course with the current development cycle for 6.1, we will likely see the final version ship either December 4th or 11th of 2022. So we'll just keep an eye on all of this because it's moving fast and there's a lot still to be worked out. And we'll share the relevant updates on the kernel and everything else going on in the world of Linux and open source. So check out linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get every episode. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch. And we just recently reviewed the newly updated Thalio workstation from System76. Go check out our review in Linux Unplugged 480. We'll be back next week with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week.